Okay, we're now recording. Awesome. All right. Admitting it all and beginning. Here we go. Okay, this is good. We see uh, participants are joining the webinar. Yep. We'll wait a few minutes till everybody gets in. We have a large group with us today. And it's still climbing. Here we go. Admitting more and more of you. 190 and counting. Okay, we've still got some people coming in. All right, here we go. All right, we've peaked past 200 and climbing. It's like, uh, it's like watching a meter go um, up and up and up and up as we uh, keep admitting people from the room. All right, we're at 1201, Carolyn, so I suggest we start Start the engines. <laughs> okay, we'll get going. So welcome everybody. We're delighted to have you with us today. Uh, we can see that there are some people who had joined us uh, on Tuesday earlier this week and we're delighted to have you back with us and welcome to everybody who's joining us for the first time. My name is Carolyn Samuel. I'm a Senior Academic Associate with Teaching and Learning Services. I'm going to be co-hosting this webinar with my colleague Adam Finkelstein, who is an Associate Director at Teaching and Learning Services. And we also have with us today our colleague Eva Dobler, who will be moderating the chat. However, we're going to ask you not to um, put lots of questions in the chat for her because with so many people, there's no way she'll be able to answer all the questions. So we're going to leave some time at the end to answer some questions. Um, feel free to use the chat and communicate with one another. We've noticed that um, colleagues are very good at giving each other ideas. So um, just we want to create the expectation though that we will not be able to answer all of your questions in the chat. Ava will be posting links though that are relevant to the things we're talking about today. We also wanted to mention that we've had a couple of comments from instructors saying that um, they've noticed that we're always two people co-hosting our webinars and they've, they've wondered if one has to co-host with two people and or if they can just do their classes, for example, on their own. So we thought it would be important to say why we do this in pairs. We have had to learn a lot of information in a very short amount of time, and no single one of us is able to retain everything. So we're working together to rely on one another to fill in gaps with content knowledge. So we just wanted to share that with you. Um, okay, so let's get going with the content. We're talking today about assessment, and uh, we're looking at designing assessments for remote delivery. And we'd like to remind you, just here, okay, about the slide we showed last time. This is a model for course design that we're applying for course adaptation. So we'd like to remind you that this is a framework you can follow when you're adapting your course. Last time we talked a lot about context, a little bit about content. We also mentioned learning outcomes, and today we are going to talk more about learning outcomes, but what their relevance is to designing assessment. So that is our focus today, designing assessments to help students achieve the learning outcomes. So we gave you some homework. We asked you to look at a resource document called Adapting Your Course for Remote Teaching. And now that you've read that document and had a couple of days to think about the, the content, uh, we'd like to ask you this question, how are you feeling now? And Adam, I'd like to ask you to launch a poll so that our participants can respond and let us know how they're feeling right now. All right, so poll has been launched and you should see uh, options. Okay, you already see it, it's rising like crazy. You won't be able to see the, the actual uh, bars rising. It's one of the limitations in the poll. I have to wait until um, at least a good percentage is answered. We're already well over 55, 58%, 50%, 60%. So as soon as uh, we get to a 90 plus percent answered, I'll uh, open and, and show the poll to everybody so you'll be able to see the results. Okay, we still have some results coming in. We've got 190 of 272. Okay, more, more are coming in. This is good. 
I see a great suggestion from Ken that we should have had a multiple response, not multiple choice and not a forced choice. Good, good suggestion, Ken. We'll, uh, we'll keep that in mind for our next run that you might be both uncertain, motivated, tired, laid back and confident all at the same time. Um, so I think that's a, that's a great suggestion. Uh, any more um, responses? Because we're going to close the poll in about uh, um, five to, to eight seconds here, counting down. All right, I'm going to end the poll. Here we go. Here's our responses. Everybody should be able to uh, uh, see those results. So many of you are feeling uncertain. That's not surprising. This is new. We're in uncharted territory right now. But at the same time, many of you feel motivated. So that's gratifying to see. So hoping that uh, as we go through this webinar and the subsequent ones later this month, that uh, that feeling of certainty will diminish, the motivation will rise, and the confidence will be boosted too. Okay, so maybe we'll uh, keep going then. We have three outcomes for today's session that you'll be aware of the assessment options for remote teaching. And uh, I'd like to make the point here that we do have an agenda. You might be tempted to map your assessments one-to-one. -one. Like if you did an exam before, you're gonna do an exam now. We're gonna show you options today and encourage you to think a little more broadly than that. Always with learning outcomes in mind though. Um, we're hoping you'll be able to build diversity into and foster academic integrity in your assessments and then be ready to plan the assessments because there are more webinars coming up and uh, each step of the way, we're hoping that you build what you're doing. This is our plan for today's session. Course adaptation considerations, what we're going to encourage you to think about that when you're designing your assessments, you design them to support student learning. You design them so that students are allowed to demonstrate their learning in a variety of ways. Also that you design them so that they foster academic integrity and that they allow for frequent, small and low stakes assessments. So we're gonna develop each of these ideas. We talked about le uh, learning outcomes last time, we're bringing them back this time. Match assessment with level of learning. So Bloom's taxonomy is likely gonna be familiar to many of you, maybe not to all of you, that's okay. Bloom's taxonomy talks about levels of learning. And I have to say, when I show this to my students, I talk about this in terms of brain power. So what we see here is verbs that allow us to see how students can demonstrate their learning. And each of these from the bottom of the pyramid going up requires what I'm gonna call increased levels of brain power. So we have at the bottom remembering. Remembering information or understanding information is not as demanding as trying to apply information or analyze information or evaluate and so on as we go up the pyramid. So with learning outcomes in mind and these different ways we can have students demonstrate their learning, we can think about designing our assessments. So we've got the different verbs here. Keep those in mind as we go through. We'd like to encourage you to consider combinations. So what we have in this table on the left are example learning outcomes. And you see we have those verbs again here from the different levels in that pyramid. So if we want our students to, for example, demonstrate knowledge or demonstrate their capacity to structure information or demonstrate their communication skills or maybe defend an argument, we can assess them in many different ways. Of course, this is not a complete list. These are just examples. We can give our students a multi-stage oral presentation to do. And maybe not everybody knows what a multi-stage assignment is. Um, Ava's gonna put a link in the chat if she hasn't already done it. That gives an example of a multi-stage assignment. You can have your students do, give each other peer feedback. You can assign an infographic. For example, capacity to structure information, students can illustrate that with a graphic. 
So we have a number of different examples here. I won't go through all of them, but again, the point we want to make is broaden the horizons, allow students to demonstrate their learning in a variety of ways. Nothing wrong with exams, but maybe instead of having one exam, there's a smaller exam, and then you have some additional ways that students can demonstrate their learning. We have lots of different examples on the TLS website. Again, Ava will put the link in the chat to example evaluation schemes, which offers many examples of learning outcomes um, associated with a variety of assessment types. So Adam, I'm gonna turn it over to you to address how um, students can demonstrate learning in a variety of ways. Perfect. Uh, thanks so much, Carolyn. And I, I think this is such a critical uh, a step uh, in the process of thinking about assessment because we really have to uh, unpack some of the ideas that we have of, of connecting our learning outcomes with the types of tasks we want students to do. So the first one you see there, it, it talks about artifacts. So a, a great example, if we talk about uh, what you would like to do, let's say you're interested in um, having students defend an argument. So you're doing, maybe you want presentations or something along those lines. You have a bunch of these ideas. The artifact that they actually produce can be multiple, multiple types of things. Um, you might say, you know what, I want them to defend an argument, but it's going to be a written argument. So then the artifact that I'm going to have them submit is a paper. Okay, they're going to write it out. That sounds great. But what if you want to be able to have them defend an argument, but also think I want them to be able to do it orally. So maybe it's actually a presentation. Maybe they make a video of themselves doing that and then submit it using the assignment tool. And in fact, maybe we could actually combine things and say, well, let's think of a multi-stage assignment. So saying, well, not only do I want them to write down the core ideas of their argument and submit that as an assignment in the assignment tool, let's say in my courses, but I also want them to do an oral component of the final part of that uh, uh, assignment of that defense. So then I'm going to have them record it and submit it as another assignment uh, inside my courses. So again, you can talk about taking a particular learning outcome that you have, i.e. defending an argument, and break it up into multiple stages and have multiple components and multiple artifacts that you're submitting. The next thing that's important here is the idea that you can actually have interaction going on in that, in that demonstration of learning. So we talked about defending an argument. That argument could have parts of those components that might actually be individual and others that might be group or maybe they're both group. So in that particular example of defending an argument, you might actually have a group of students that's writing out their ideas first and submitting using the assignment tool in my courses. And then second, actually banding together, filming um, their particular presentation. And then you might think, but wait a minute, if they're at home, how do I film or how do they film a presentation together? Well, they can spin up Zoom or, or Teams or other uh, uh, type of tool and do what we're doing now, record it and send it. And voila, a group presentation, even though everybody is actually at home. So again, you have that option in the interaction. The third part that we have to keep in mind in terms of demonstrating learning um, is the opportunity for feedback. And there's a number of different possibilities that we have to think about when we want to say, well, what do we want to do with our students in terms of what types of feedback we want them to have? So for example, that intentional feedback you might want might be self-assessment. It might be that they have to do a reflection. Great opportunity to think about how they did, what they're doing, the stages of thinking, et cetera. Another option might be you want peer assessment to occur. We have a number of tools that support this in terms of using this in assignment to have students actually evaluating each other's work in a way that's all taken care of and that's managed behind the scenes with some of our technologies that support that. And the last might be, well, the instructor, TA grader, you could be giving that feedback from the assignment tool or one other mechanism uh, that you might as, uh, want to as well. So there's really a lot of possible possibilities of how to demonstrate the learning. We have to think about the artifacts we want students to create. We have to think about the types of interaction, group, uh, individual, and then we have to think about the types of feedback we want to provide those students. Now, if we move on to the, to the next slide, I think... Sorry, Adam, just before we go to the next slide, I'm just going to say, keep in mind, mix and match. Mix Absolutely. and match, mix and match. Yeah, and I think that's that's something that we keep saying in all of the sessions that variety is critical. You know, you want a variety of strategies, a variety of assessments, breaking things down into smaller pieces. And that's actually a really good segue here because of this particular study. So this is a really interesting study that talks about academic, academic integrity. And academic integrity is a really... Um, a big issue that everybody brings up with assignments right away or assignments or assessments or quizzes or any type of assessment is how do I ensure that, the, the, that there is integrity within the assignment that we have? 
What's very interesting is this particular study that looked at contract cheating and what, what contract cheating is defined as in this situation is basically getting somebody else to do the work you're supposed to do as a student. Could be buying a paper, could be having your friend do it, could be having your parents do it, anything along those lines. That's what the, they mean by contract cheating. And what's really interesting if we, we look at the bottom two is that the students' perceptions on the likelihood of contract cheating was mostly connected with, and if you keep going in the slide, uh, we'll see the little box, it's mostly connected with heavily weighted tasks that have short turnaround times. So if you really want to ensure that academic integrity is preserved, you really want to avoid heavily weighted tasks. The 50% assessment that you're going to have students submit once, it gives, gives the students a huge uh, concern around um, the, the, the issue of timelines, the issue of waiting, they're worried, and they're much more likely to contract out as an example for cheating. And you're looking at the numbers here, it's double. It's not just a small number. These last two are really critical. The second one, of course, being that short turnaround time that you give students two hours to do it and it's a super high stakes scenario, guess what? Students are more likely to go down a road where they're looking for help to get that done. So I think that's something really, really important. And there's, a, there's some great... Um, uh, this came from a study, by the way, with 14,000 students across eight institutions. So this is a huge uh, a cohort that they were looking at. And one of the things that, that we're going to post up as well as the references where um, there's, a, there's a great, uh, I think it's Phil Dawson, I can never remember what the P stands for. Um, Phil Dawson from, uh, uh, from Australia, who's really an amazing presenter to talk to, to listen to about uh, all the research around things like contract cheating and academic integrity. And what's really, really critical are a couple of things that have come out of that, that I, that I really want to go farther into. So this is one of those things that we have to think about is that it's very clear that we need to worry about how heavily weighty uh, the tap, how heavily weighty, it's not exactly a real word, but how much weight we are actually putting onto some of our assessments, because the more we put weight on, the more percentages we're adding, the more stress levels that students get, the more concerned they are, and the more, more likelihood for something to uh, uh, go wrong when it comes to academic integrity. So if we move to the next slide, uh, um, I think these are some really important encouraging notes that we need to think about. To, to in order to encourage original work by students, we need to think about applying personal experience when answering those questions. Draw upon students' real life experiences so that you are able to easily see that it's coming from their perspective. It forces them to do those kind of, uh, uh, that that kind of thinking. Second is, you know, selecting topics and project topics early in the term, giving them feedback on it. The multi-stage process makes it extremely difficult to, to do cheating all the way or, or that kind of contract cheating because you have to demonstrate with an outline and then the next stage and a draft and then the final version. Um, we need to show evidence of the evolution of ideas that again encourages that original work from happening. And lastly, actually that signing an honor code actually has been shown to really help uh, ensure that students are are following and uh, and encouraging that original work. So you know one of the things that key here is you notice that there's a balance of the academic integrity and assessment security. Um, and I think one of the things that's very clear is that one of my favorite phrases that I've been thinking about in the last two months is we need to be focused on student success, not student surveillance. Increasing surveillance does not guarantee success. All it does is increase surveillance, okay? And this is one of the things, and one of the reasons why you see why proctoring has really been pushed aside as a solution for McGill. Because proctoring, they've done a lot of interesting studies around proctoring. And if you really go back to that webinar, there's a great story that the guy says, the guy tried to use, Dawson, to, to try to actually find out how good the proctoring software was. He got a funded study and he went to all of the providers and guess what? They didn't let him use the software. <laughs> they didn't want to know how good the software was. They didn't want people to know how easy it was to get around it. So I think we have to be aware that, you know, a technological sort of security solutions do not really solve the problem. You do want to have some security for sure. Um, but I think the other thing we need to do is encourage that original work and have integrity in the process. And that's really what these bullets are talking about to making sure it's personal experiences. There's a stepwise solution here that you're showing evidence of ideas. Um, examples of a short oral presentation to defend it all demonstrates that the students are actually doing that work. Um, so I'll just I'll just add that we can put a link on our website to the um, to that webinar. It's available to the public. Um, we'll include it in the references which will be posted to the TLS website. I don't absolutely. think Ava that you have that link but we can put it up later. Yeah. And, and also I want to reference at the bottom of the slide, it talks about Rutgers has a really great page on, 
on uh, advice around open book assessments and the idea of, and it actually has some great ideas about why they didn't go with proctoring, why a lot of universities have not gone that route, and why they've come up with other alternatives. Now, keeping in mind that you have to change your assessments, but, but, but one of the things is, is that in remote teaching scenario, we have to change our assessments. It, it's not, we're not able to do exactly the kind of things we were doing before. And you know what? That's an opportunity to improve them. That's an opportunity to look at what our assessments are doing and figure out, is this really the best way to get at determining whether or not student learning has happened? And I think that's one of those critical pieces uh, um, that, that, that's there as well. We do have some suggestions on honor codes. That's, uh, that's also going to be available online. A lot of the resources will be there as well. Um, so that's something to keep in mind. And I think the last bullet point of the slide or the last, uh, the last story, the next slide that I want to really touch on is some great recommendations to think about what we want to do with our students. So recall the graph about that high stakes assessments and think about it and say, you know what, what the best thing we can do is have frequent, small, low stakes assessments. It's, it, it sort of flows from all of the research around assessment. It gives students constant formative feedback so they can improve along the way. It helps demonstrate original work. In other words, it hits all the marks. So the idea that when we're going into a remote teaching scenario in the fall, having one midterm and one final it is really not gonna work. It's not an appropriate approach and it's something you really have to rethink. But the nice thing is it doesn't mean that if you have to start from scratch, you can take your idea around a midterm and say, you know what I'll do with my midterm exam is I'm gonna split it up so that there's something each week. Each week we'll have 10 questions around that, get students to generate ideas, small weekly quizzes. Many people at McGill are doing this. It's a great easy way of keeping students on track and helping them practice ideas. The biweekly journal re uh, reflections and submissions, another great, excellent idea to be able to, um, to, to ensure that students are keeping up with the ideas, that they're demonstrating their learning. Portfolio contributions, we have tools to support all of that. And again, that you know, we've said it a number of times, you'll see a theme through this, multi-stage assignments. Take ideas that you have for assessments, break them up into smaller pieces that are more digestible and that you can spread out over time, and you're going to get better original work, um, you're going to get more learning from your students, and you're going to have more success uh, along the way. So, so Adam, I'd, I'd yeah. just like to pick up on something you said a minute ago, the idea of keeping students on track. So we make our best effort to give students deadlines, to remind them when they need to submit assignments and so on. But um, students sometimes need support with keeping on track with their work. And having these regular low stakes assessments helps them to stay up to date with their coursework. They stay, stay on top of their readings. They stay on top of the, the material for quizzes. They don't get into that situation where all of a sudden they have a paper to write and they haven't done any of the reading. Or all of a sudden they have an exam or a quiz and they haven't done any of the practice. So this way, it's, it's not just about the academic integrity piece. There's also this um, collateral benefit of helping students stay up to date with what they need to do to support their learning. And, and, I'm glad uh, you uh, mentioned that about keeping on track. Absolutely. And I, I think, you know, there's been some comments I'm seeing flowing through the chat that are, are, are important to think about. No one solution you know, solves the academic integrity problem. It's not a simple problem and there is no simple solution. And I think that's an important point as well. You know, just adding an honor code is, is not going to work. Just adding proctoring is not going to work. We, we need to look at a suite of options that really encourage students along that track. And the reality is at the end of the day, you know, uh, there's, uh, we're having conversations with, with people that are looking at um, uh, professional schools that have professional accreditation exams. You know what, guess what? If the student doesn't have an, sort of a, uh, their own work and their own process all the way through, at some point they're gonna hit a really hard wall. And, and that's something we can demonstrate to our students that, okay, you might get away with it on a couple assignments here and there, but once you get to the final aspect of this course, when we're looking at a, a multi-stage uh, assessment that has parts presentation, parts submission, et cetera, it's gonna be very, very obvious. And the other interesting thing that, that, um, that was done in a lot of these academic integrity sections is they talked about how you know training people to keep an eye out for what constitutes sort of contract cheating or, or when it's clearly somebody else writing work. Um, this is something you can do with your TAs. There's guidelines that you can have that are available that you can read through and sort of look at. And if a TA goes, is on the lookout for, hmm, you know, this assignment looks totally different than the last assignment the student handed in. And, you know, suddenly um, their writing language, their whole writing style changed. You know, maybe we need to have a conversation about that. So those are really important things. So awareness is really critical um, and discussions with your students as well. 
So I think those, those combinations that we talked about, about frequent, small, low stakes, uh, and trying to spread that out as much as possible can really go a long way to help, um, help you in that process. And I think what's important to note is that, you know, we have the tools at McGill to do all of this. All of this, it's all waiting and for you to just step through the door. Um, we have uh, uh, further uh, webinars that, that we, we talked about that will be available uh, next starting next week that you can see on our website. A uh, good example is one um, that talks about uh, creating online assessments uh, in my courses that talks about quizzes and assignments. What's better for one and the other? Why do I want to do assignment? How would I want to do a quiz? What's best for an open book exam? What's best for a take home exam? Those are, are really sort of in, important um, next steps that you want to think about, along with all the other webinars that are there as well. The first two this week, which are again repeating next week, are the planning sessions and the, and the uh, designing assessment sessions. But next week, we start the next level, which is really the implementation part, where how do you prepare content? How do you get students interacting? What are some things you could do with polling at McGill? How do you get students more involved with Zoom? Um, how do you uh, engage online assessments? What's peer assessment? And hey, uh, can I use a tool called PeerGrade that McGill has to support that? Absolutely. Um, um, and of course, in last, managing your courses with my courses. So these are all really important next steps. And I would encourage you to, to look at that as, as a next step to go uh, uh, in your process. But know that we already have a lot of these tools. And a lot of the cases that, that people have asked is, can the assessment tool do this? Can the assignment tool do this? Can the quiz tool do this? Most of the time, the answer is yes. <laughs> um, there are some times where, you know, oh, we, it has to be done in a slightly different way as an example. But just to give you an, an, an example of the um, uh, multi-stage assessment that the assignment tool can, you can submit anything to the assignment tool. You can submit a, um, you can submit a, uh, a, a document, you can submit a video, you can submit audio, you can submit anything you want. So, you know, we can use our tools to gather all of that information. Um, so maybe I, I you know, uh, I'll hand this over to Carolyn. Uh, you've got a couple of interesting things here about next steps. Um, let's talk about the document. Yeah, just before we go to next steps on the document, um, I put something else up on the screen. I just need to be sure that everybody can see this, feedback strategies, engaging students in dialogue. Can I get a nod from somebody? Can you see a PDF? Okay, so it looks like people, great. Okay, I get response. Okay, got it, you see it, excellent. So Ava had put this link in the chat a little bit earlier, and I'm going to just show you an example of a multi-stage assignment. I'm looking here, this is page 17 of the document, and we have some information about how you can design a multi-stage assessment, but what I want to do is actually put the example up for you to see. So students can do some pre-research, this is for a term paper, I should have said that, but it can certainly apply to an oral presentation or a team project. So you can have students do some pre-research, um, describe a topic, the known facts, and then they submit that through the assignments tool in my courses. Then they can do a research prospectus, so they're building on the research that they did, and you can have them submit an annotated bibliography subsequent to that, that would be the third stage. And then as they continue developing their knowledge of the topic, they can work toward developing a working thesis, and then they can submit a working thesis that will guide their research for their term paper. And then they can submit the, the research paper, the term paper at the end of the term. So we've put this example here with dates, to, to give you a sense of how much time students would have to complete each of these uh, stages of the assignment. And uh, yeah, it's a pretty comprehensive example to give you a sense. And this would make it much more challenging for students to breach academic integrity because they would have to be showing their thought process and their, their you know, how they're learning along the way. They couldn't just buy a paper, they couldn't contract for a paper the night before the paper is due. Okay, I'm just going to toggle back to our slides. So we're here and we want to, we're hoping that you'll prepare for upcoming webinars by reading again, taking another look if needed um, at this adapting your course for remote teaching document and this adapting your assessment strategies for remote teaching. So these are our two companion documents for these webinars. And we would encourage you to take a look at these example assessment schemes or evaluation schemes. And I am gonna to toggle back to the web now just to show you where those are. So I'm going back to the TLS website, a few clicks away. 
And I will go to our disruption to classes page. And from here, I'm going to go to strategies for remote teaching and assessment. And I'm clicking on assessment strategies. And then here we have the example evaluation schemes. And again, Ava has put this link in the chat. And what we see here is a number of examples. Um, each one begins with learning outcomes. And then we have examples of assessments that total 100%. And we include here the tools that you can use to do these assessments. We're not talking about the tools today though, that will be for a subsequent webinar. Adam went through that little curriculum map with you, that graphic. But we we're hoping that you'll take a look at these examples and keep in mind that you can mix and match. So the idea here, we, we write, we encourage you to mix and match these strategies to best support student learning in your courses. Remember, it's contextual. We talked a lot about context um, in the last webinar, we have to keep context and learning outcomes in mind. So I'll just go back to uh, our slides here. We have that. And we want to remind you about My Courses Essentials, that uh, this is a self-paced tutorial to help you become familiar with My Courses tools if you're not already familiar with them. And here, this is just to illustrate 67. There's activity in this course. You can post your questions there. This is a monitored discussion forum. You will get responses to your questions. Um, this is not a, my course is how you do everything. This is the essentials. It's sort of basics. You want to go beyond, we encourage you, attend the next webinars. We're going to do our best to provide you with the support you need to do all the different assessment types that you would like to do for your students in your courses. And we'd like to know from you as, oh, sorry, Adam, no, did you no, want to say something? Think, before we get to the last slide, I think there's a couple of good questions that I think are worth addressing and discussing a, a little bit more. Uh, I just want to bring up one of them. Uh, I've been sort of scanning this chat as we're going uh, with some of these questions. A lot of them are being answered in the chat, but I just want to mention a few that haven't been adjusted yet. You know, how to ensure that students don't cheat, um, i.e. consult course materials when taking a mini quiz. Um, you know, this is a really good question. There is nothing that prevents every, you know, cheating at 100%. It's impossible. There's no way. Um, however, what you can do is, again, structure uh, those short questions uh, that you might be doing every week where they're not all automatically multiple choice, where you just go A, B, C, D, A, B, C, D, and you don't have to do anything. You could have open questions, get students to respond uh, around, let's say, a case, give your feedback on a case as an example. You could have a few knowledge checks that you do as well. I think it's something to keep in mind that in a remote learning scenario, most things are open book. And I think that's an, a useful way of thinking about the types of assessments you're going to do. Um, and, and, and those knowledge checks you can uh, uh, do where you're getting students to generate ideas and not just choose them. So I think it's, it's no one solution is perfect. I think you want to do a bunch of little things as much as possible to be able to ensure that students are, are keeping up and keeping on track. Um, so, uh, 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 several people are asking about how they get access to my courses essentials. Um, if you don't have access, do send a ticket to IT support and ask them to give you access to it. Yeah, there, there's, there's a scan that's supposed to happen every morning that actually adds people in. Um, and uh, uh, that's something that if it's not happened for some particular reason, you can get added, please do contact uh, IT. I think that's an important, uh, important thing to do. And there's a discussion board on there as well for, for that kind of uh, uh, help that you might be able to bounce ideas off uh, in the same way. Um, so I think the other thing we can do is address it. If there are any other questions, maybe Ava, um, if there's anything you've grabbed that are holding on to that you want to add from uh, to us from the chat, or if anybody else has some questions before we get to our kind of last slide, we do have a, a couple of minutes to go. Oh, and there's a great comment here that I don't consider looking at notes to answer quizzes as cheating. I think that's a really, really insightful point that, you know, especially in the realm today where almost everything is Googleable um, and everything we do in our job is Googleable. So the question is, is that, you know, some of those details, if we can find the information effectively, um, is uh, almost as useful. Now, keep in mind some things you need to know. I don't want my heart surgeon mixing up between the atrium and a ventricle. Those are things, there are certain things you have to know, and we have to make sure those opportunities are there too. Um, okay, some of the questions here. 
you know, is it possible to have a separate webinar specific to large courses? We, we don't have a webinar specifically on large courses. That is something that we could definitely take back and start thinking about. I mean, all of the things we talk about are applicable to all sizes of courses. It just depends on how you implement them. Um, and I think obviously there are going to be some things to think about. You know, you might sort of say it at first that, oh, you know, it's really not going to be possible if I'm doing a, a math exam. I can't do that electronically. I can't scale that. There's no way I can do that with 500 people. Not the case. We have a tool called Crowdmark that actually almost all the first year science courses are using that allows students to actually write out problems and, and grade them at scale with 700 students. Uh, it's very doable. It's changed people's lives in the process and changed student learning. So definitely size is can be a, a context you have to work with, but it's definitely not a complete barrier in, in those situations to learning. I'd like to address this question about how technological savvy, savvy we should expect our students to be beforehand. That is a good question. Um, our students are very knowledgeable sometimes about social media tools, for example. You know, they can use Instagram, they can use Facebook. That doesn't necessarily mean they know how to use all the tools in my courses or that they know how to use Zoom. So I think it would be safe to assume that we need to teach our students how to use these tools effectively and not make assumptions that they are perhaps digital natives, which is a term in question anyway, but we should not assume that all our students know how to use these tools readily. So just as we are learning, we have to expect that we'll need to teach our students how to, to use the tools effectively and provide guidance as needed. And you should know that there are webinars being offered for students. And maybe Ava, you can put the link in the chat to the student resources page. On the TLS website, we do have a page for students. Some workshops have already happened, there will be more, but students also have the opportunity to have orientation to Zoom tools and to other tools to facilitate their learning. So let's not make assumptions about their ability with tech tools. And I, and I think actually that's a great thing to ask at the beginning. You know, if, if you've got a pre, uh, you know, beginning of term survey that you do with your students, ask them, ask them what their bandwidth is, ask them their context for where they're, where they're learning. I mean, are they dealing with a, a multi, you know, a multifamily home where they're fighting for internet bandwidth or they're fighting for a quiet place to work? These are important things to learn about your students. Absolutely. And what's really interesting is noting the Swiss cheese knowledge when it comes to students about technology. There are some that are super savvy and some that are not. But what's really interesting is if you put them into a group, you know, if you have five students working on a project, odds are one of them knows how to do video really well. And that's something you can think about and, and work to your advantage. You know, um, maybe they need to, con maybe they, they, those, your students need to contact one of their younger siblings to help them make a, a video like with TikTok or something like that. Um, but I think there really are a lot of options that people can draw upon. And it also helps with your own students to understand that you don't have to know everything. As long as you've got some people in your group that can, you can work off roles and have, oh, you're really good at putting the video together. Why don't we do this? And you'll do that as an example. So I think that's a great idea of having a group work uh, involved. And, um, and something that we talked about in the last webinar as well is the idea of surveying students. So as you said, Adam, um, you can ask students what their knowledge is with certain tools. And you can do that with survey tools. There's a survey tool in my courses. You can do polling with Zoom. You can do polling with uh, polling at McGill, which is a, a tool that still works with Zoom. You can integrate that. So there are different ways to actually pull students and get that information. And I think students will probably appreciate that you're interested in knowing what their capacity is and you know, what they're gonna be able to do as the semester goes along. Um, there was a comment about um, teaching students centrally to use the tools. Indeed, the, the webinars that TLS offers, that's open to all students at the university. Um, I guess I wasn't really thinking that all instructors would take time to individually teach their classes how to use the tools, but just know that they might need tips like, you know, you might want to show them where the tools are in Zoom and say, remember to click here, remember to click there. Just we don't want to assume that they're going to understand this readily. And there's also a lot of, of um, options this summer. I know that the, both uh, uh, at TLS, the student skills uh, arm of uh, TLS, as well as um, student services, enrollment services, there's a huge effort to uh, get, reach out to students, to get them early, to level them up with any skills they need. There's learning with Zoom webinars that are being offered to students. Um, there's learning webinars in general being offered to them. So really tap into the network at McGill that is very strong this summer uh, to really get uh, uh, students involved uh, early with understanding the, the scenario that's going to happen in the fall and what remote teaching is really going to mean to them. 
So Adam, just in the interest of time, we can still answer a few more questions, but I am gonna to go to the next slide. Um, we would like to ask you what your most important takeaway from today's session is and, and have you type that in the chat. And we do this for a couple of reasons. It's helpful for us to get the feedback from you so that we know the extent to which our learning outcomes for this session were achieved because we did prepare specific learning outcomes and we'd like to know what you're taking away from this session. Um, but at the same time, if you articulate what it is that is important for you as a takeaway, it increases the chances that you'll remember it. So we're also modeling a strategy that you can use with your students. It's, it's not complicated. At the end of a class, you can ask students to type in the chat or to post something to my courses as an alternative um, that lets you know what students took away from the class and that can inform your teaching in subsequent classes. So if you see most students understood X concept, then you know you can go forward with the next one. If most students didn't understand X concept, then maybe you need to go back the next class and revisit it. So this is, excuse me, a way to get information that can inform your teaching. And as I said, at the same time, it would be a way for your students to attend to what they understand or what they take away from the class. Like it gets highlighted for them. So some, some really amazing uh, comments here uh, that are, are coming up with a lot of the issues that we had raised today. I, you know, that's really fantastic. Um, I think a lot of people are still asking about like where to go next, where to go next. That's what our curriculum is for. Um, and actually, uh, Carolyn, if you just jump back uh, yeah. to that slide, I think it's an important one. Um, if you go to our website, um, you will find all of those webinars listed for the entire month of June, all the way to the beginning of July go sign up for them. After those webinars, those recordings of those webinars will be available. There will be follow-up tutorials on that as well. There will be plenty of support available to you once you make kind of the decisions. And this is why planning is so important now is to kind of get a game plan in, in mind. You can't learn all the tools. You can't do everything. And, and it's really important to, to give you that, that support that no one's expecting everybody to, to be experts in everything. I mean, the idea is that you need to pick what's going to work well for your learning outcomes in your course, given your context and time, you know, we've got three months, right? You know, that's it. Um, and, and I think that uh, uh, that's an important piece to think about as to which tools you want to use, what's the best bang for your buck and to follow up from there. Um, and I think that's one of the important things that really the next steps are there. They're laid out in front here. Um, we would really urge you to, uh, to think about what to do next. Um, and I, I think there's still a, a number of questions which are really important about large classes and, you know, trading off TAs for engagement versus grading. You know, this is a really good question. I think, Rex, you, you brought this up as a, a really good question about, you know, how do I balance if I have TAs help in the class, like live with Zoom doing moderating or maybe running a breakout session or something like that, how do I balance that with their need for grading? This is something you should bring up with your faculty about increased TA support. Please do that internally. Um, you have people that you can escalate that to. Um, but in addition as well, this is where some of the tools can be very helpful. So depending on the the types of assessments you want to do. We have some amazing thing, uh, tools in place like peer grade for peer assessment to spread out the kind of types of assessment you're doing. Crowdmark to do sort of incredible assessments at scale um, that, uh, that you can have students writing out problems, taking pictures of them, all sorts of stuff like that. So there are tools available and it's really going to depend on what you want to do um, to be able to, uh, to move forward. Um, and um, I think there, there are a couple of others here. Uh, Carolyn, is there one you want to address that you see? Um, I'm just looking through. So there is a question about can it be made obligatory for students to take a training zoom zoom training in my courses training. Um, I don't think it can be made obligatory. No, but uh, you can certainly encourage students to do that. You can put links in your my courses site to resources for students. Um, so you can encourage them that way and let them know that you think it's a good idea for them to do it. So links in your My Courses site will be helpful. You can also communicate with your students before the course starts. So you'll, you'll have access to your class list beforehand and you can open your My Courses site before the course starts and you can encourage students to uh, Look, in the, look at the My Courses site, click around, click here, click there. You can encourage them to access the student resources before the semester starts. So, so Adam, it's 12.45. Yeah, we're um, at our time. 
We are out of time. We'll stay on for another couple of minutes, but we'd like to thank everybody for joining us today, for um, enthusiastically participating in the chat, and um, just remind you that all the recordings for all our webinars and all the slides will be available on our webinars page. We have a nice new webinars page. You can see the descriptions there for all the webinars. You can register there. And uh, we've got the URL on the screen. Ava has put it multiple times in the chat as well. So um, please take a look at the resources, share them with people you know, uh, colleagues who weren't able to attend today, and join us in the coming weeks. We look forward to seeing you. So thank you very much, everybody. Absolutely. Thanks, everybody, for coming. And, you know, uh, there's a lot of support, a lot of help available for the fall. And I'm sure we can make it a, a really good, positive experience, both for our students and for you. Um, so thanks again. Okay, bye-bye, everybody. If you still do have a question, you can fire it off in the chat, and we can uh, stay for a minute or two as well.